Hello. Okay, welcome to the January 18th Ohio US Web Dev SIG. Also, what is George eating? That's our subtitle for lunch because we're a lunchtime meeting in the central time zone. Um, we're gonna Brendan had a question about slow check-in, so we'll start there. I'll, I'll let you re repeat that for the um, So this uh, we had this um, when we first migrated. We had a lot of reports from all of our libraries that um, checking items into the hold shelf from transit um, would be just kind of slow. Like it would take like five seconds or something to check the item in. Um, and we eventually found that it had to do with our pseudonymization um, setting. So we like, once we turned off that pseudonymization, then um, that problem kind of went away, but it just seems like it's popped up. At least one library reported today um, the same sort of issue. Um, so way back when, I don't know, like six months ago or so or more, um, when we were troubleshooting it the first time, um, Bywater asked to like get information about those patron records or those item records um, to try to troubleshoot it. Like, is it, did it have to do with like having many items attached to the bib or many holds on the bib or the patron maybe has many checkouts or something like that. Um, so just wondering if anybody's ever had that problem and what things you looked at. I don't, I don't get a lot of complaints about slowness at that point. Um, one thing you could check is the number of items the screen is set to display on check-in. Like if that table gets really big, then it slows it down. Um, and that's a system preference. It's, uh, I'll put it in chat. But that's what I was going to suggest too. Ours is set to 20. So if yours is set to like some astronomical number, that could be causing slowness in the check-in. But other than that, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know. That that um system preference was in my autofill. Like I searched for it before, so that's yeah, that's funny. <laughs> What's the name of that preference again? Num returned items to show. Yeah, ours is set to fifteen. Yeah, mine's set to twenty. Um, because that is the issue. Every time it, it ha every time you check something in, that table has to be rebuilt. So Koha is going to query all fifteen of the items that are in that table. Now I'm uh, also remembering maybe there's that checkbox at the bottom that says um, always show checkouts. That was another thing that we. That's in the um, check. -in. That's when you're checking things out. That's not at the check-in oh, stage. That's in, okay. Yeah. That's at the checkout. Well, thank you guys. Now we can do yeah. um, web development stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I do I, have a development. I do have a piece of jQuery I use related to that. It's sometimes helpful to know how many things you're checking in. So I actually have an added column with jQuery that tells you um, which number that numbers the rows as you as you check things in. I often tell people, at least when I was working at circulation, I would say check five things in and then check and make sure that, you know, there's actually five in the table. <laughs> I have a question about Google, Google Analytics 4. Um, I asked a question about, you know, how you set up Google Analytics and they sent me the, the link to the information. And I I had that set up, but now that Google Analytics 4 is available and I've set it up, how to set it up in OHA. I submitted a ticket and they referred it to Lucas, but I haven't heard anything back yet. Yeah, so it's just going to be a matter of putting that little code in the um, in HTML customization for OPAC credits. Um, I can show you what mine looks like, okay. but Lucas will probably get you fixed up once he gets to you. Um, 
see if I can get that pulled up real fast. So my my Google Analytics is just in an OPAC credits um, HTML customization I got here by going to tools and then HTML customizations. Um, and it's set for all libraries because I want to uh, track it no matter what. Okay. Um, and then the actual code snippet is just this. Okay. And I can put that, I can put that in the and I like a paste then for you in the chat um, wh where you would just change this number here and this number here to whatever your your analytics ID is. Okay. Thank you. And hopefully have... nobody watching the recording is like, I want Jason's Google Analytics ID. I'm going to start inflating his statistics. <laughs> uh, I, I was just thinking have... about doing that. So <laughs> go for it. Look, I just hope I remember to change that <laughs> to our code. Um, but I do have another question, but it's not about web. It's about the whole, the whole slip. Um, I had a uh, call with Esther from Bowater and she demonstrated the native, how it works natively in Koha. And so I watched the video again to make sure I was following all the steps correctly. And I tried to do it in my system. And the she said, when you play uh, once the hole is placed, you go into circulation and then you go to holes to pull and you should see the holes. I know I don't see the holes. But when I go to the, the patron's record, I see that the, the hole is there, but it's not there where she tells me to go look in order to print the hole slip. It sounds like maybe a cron's not running. That's, what it, that's exactly what I was going to say. It sounds to me like there's a cron job. There is a cron job that builds that holds report. And if that's not running right, then... Uh, are you doing this on a test system, Janice? Like it's not a, or is it your uh, real actually, system? Actually, it's on our system. It's our test of the migration of them hosting us. And so okay, I so oftentimes they don't turn all the cron jobs on on those test systems, so it okay. doesn't like send messages and stuff. So you may have to ask them to turn on the holds cron job before it'll refresh that uh, okay. correctly. That would be my first guess. Okay, because that's kind of like the last of my hold up before we go live. I want to make sure it's working. Yeah, I just looked it up. The name of the cron job is build holds queue. And I'll put a link to that spot. Well, maybe I'll put a link to that spot in the manual. But... Thank you. Get copy and paste working right. There's the there's the link now in the chat box to where to find that information about that cron in the in the Koha manual. Thank you. Are there other questions or cool things you've been doing with Koha? Well, I have a weird thing that's happening to me, and it's in the Koha OPAC, only on the detail page. When I go into that record, I've got some different things in my CSS that tell it different parts of it to be bold. And when it loads, they're bold, and then a second or two later, all of the styling disappears. And if I inspect those different places, I've got it, I can see that it says it's supposed to be bold. And it works fine on my iPad and other computers. So I feel like it's something about my specific computer, but I don't know how to find how to fix that. 
Can you send us a link? Mm -hmm. But you're saying it'll probably work fine for us, but it'll it that's what I'm work for you. That's what I'm expecting, but okay. Let's see. Honestly, it's what I'm expecting too. It's not going to break while you're talking to us. I'm trying to remember the name of that movie where it's like with Ben Stiller and it's a superhero movie. And one of the superheroes' his superpower is he can turn invisible, but only when nobody's looking at him. That's mystery the way man. these problems usually yeah. work. Yeah, mystery man, that was it. So what's supposed to be bold? Uh, the title, Alex Cross Must Die. Yeah. Uh, the series. Uh, I think most of the subject headings. those three things at least. And I can sit here and refresh my page and I see them be bold and then they go right away. Yeah, on mine they're staying bold. So That's which browser are you using? Chrome. I'm using Firefox. So let me open up a Chrome. I, I don't think they're bold for me. I'm using Chrome. Like I see a rule that says font weight 600 important, but it sure doesn't look bold. So maybe it is a Chrome thing. Have you tried using bold, like bold as the rule instead of a font weight rule, or like? Uh, I have not. I can try that, and I can't remember whether I had checked Firefox or not. So I'm going to do that. Yes, it's fine in Firefox. You know, when I uh, turn off the font weight, it doesn't make any difference. Right. Yeah, it doesn't look bold in Firefox for me either. Like, if I change the rule from 600 important to bold, the word bold, then I see it bold. But I don't know if that would stick either. It, it could be that, like, so, like, the rules cascade down. So it could be, like, you've got another rule overriding it further down yeah. in your, your rule set or something. But it wouldn't, it wouldn't, yeah, I don't know. Well, it's it says important, so it shouldn't override it. Right. Unless there's another important rule overriding that. <laughs> That's the yeah. danger of important. <laughs> but I don't see, I mean, you can scroll down in the inspector and sort of see the what it's canceling out. So I don't, I don't see anything that looks like it would be so I just changed my subjects to bold, I think, and I don't see any difference. So it's still saying 600 important when I inspect it. And it ends with the right thing.
And it seems like that's the default weight. Like on my opac, though, the weight is 600 by default for H1s. But it doesn't make sense that yours is unbolding unless it's something that's causing it to not be bold. Mm -hmm. I'll do some more digging. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I don't see yeah. anything else. But I mean, um, I'll poke at it some more too, if I can. When because I can see, I mean, if I if you inspect your page source, I can see your whole custom CSS thing. So maybe I can maybe something will stick out. Yeah. Um, but that would that would be my guess. It's something something is superseding it for some reason. But I don't know why. Do you have any jQuery on this? Um, yeah. Page. And I I did the um, added the disable um, thing you can do to the URL, and it didn't seem to make a difference. Okay. But it's also been a week or so since I poked at this, so I probably need to go back through everything and make sure. Well, no. what I'm noticing is that when I look at your, when I look at the style editor, there are a ton of style sheets associated with this page. Um, you know, I see ones from Goodreads, but I see like a whole bunch that say inline. Inline style sheet number 35, inline style sheet number 34. Um, there just seem to be a lot of sheets, and I'm not sure where they're all coming from. So I just where, I refresh, and it looks fine now. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like you changed it to bolder, important. I and tried bolder, I, and it does seem bolder now. Like mine still goes away, but uh... have you tried a? Um, Control F5 to clear, like do a hard refresh on the page. Still comes in as bold and then goes right back away. <laughs> Strange. Yeah, it sounds like a browser problem to me. That's, yeah. And then I'm like, I don't know how you track something. Is like your that. browser up to date? Uh, I have no idea. They get like updated by our IT department, I guess. You know, they roll out stuff. Oh, then yeah, probably is, unless they're slacking in their jobs. Yeah, well. <laughs> But yeah, uh, like George was saying, do you have like another custom style sheet applied? Like, I know there's I system preference where you can import it. I don't have anything outside of Koha that I know of. I've got all kinds of things I've done in the CSS, you know, the OPAC CSS. Right. And some of them... I've changed things in how novelist displays or how some of the synthetics displays. But you were saying you saw all these style sheets, George. So how do I, where are you looking that you can see that? Okay, let me share my screen. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Good, I'm sharing the correct screen. So if I open the... You know, you open it like you're going to look at the inspector. Right. And then there's this one over here that says style editor. Okay. 
And it says, you know, here's this inline style sheet number three, and it's got one rule in it right there. And the inline style sheet number 64 uh, it says it has 15 rules. I don't see any. So I'm wondering what's going on there. Inline style sheet number four has 91 rules. And it looks to me like what I'm what I realized is that you've also got um, the synthetic set to display here. And there's the Goodreads review, and that's what some of these are from Goodreads and uh -huh. common images and a whole bunch of other different places. But I don't see nearly as many um, you know, when I load my OPAC and look at it and inspect it that way, there's only like the Koha style sheets, really. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure where those all are out. Yeah, I imagine the ones that say Goodreads and Novelist are coming from them, but uh, I, they're just more than I'm used to seeing there. Well, that so me. that would be my concern is there's probably something in one of those that's having an effect mm -hmm. um, that that you're missing out on somewhere. Okay, that gives me something. Thanks. I was hoping Lucas would be here today to ask him some template toolkit kit questions. So I'm disappointed. I don't know if you guys saw that uh, document that uh, Andrew shared with everybody on the Bywater Slack channel, but I'm now that I, I mean, it says this, this is how you do this thing to see stuff. And I'm just not sure what I, I if I understand what, what it is, the results you see when you do that. I'm not sure how to interpret the, yeah, the mass of information that comes up. But I don't, I haven't dug into it at all. Yeah. I, I don't know either. But it was, it's good information. Interesting. Um, yeah. I'm trying to look to see if I have any of my test patrons with any overdue items so I could. So I could do anything with it right off the bat here, but I, I'm going to have to make something overdue to somebody. So that'll, that might take a few minutes. Did you I can say, show up um, what I've been... Andrew oh, shared um, the doc, the like template toolkit documentation on the Bywater Slack. Yeah, let me see if I can find that specifically. Um, I got it. I put it in chat there. Oh, that cool. Google Doc, just some uh, stuff that he wrote down that explains some things. Um, I can show off what I've been working on while you're setting that up, George. Sure. I've been playing with our statistical page manager. That. Um, so. I sort of dove head first into statistical patrons after I learned that um, they're a thing and we weren't using them doing that right. Um, but we found that uh, there we go. We found that uh, some of our our libraries wanted more like awareness when they were on a statistical patron. So I did some modifications to like highlight it over here on the left. And then I um, put a note over here on the right. I took away the, the issues table because it doesn't actually use that since it just records a local use. And then the last thing was I wanted to make sure the patron was at, uh, getting closed out. We have had concerns that like this would be pulled up, somebody would come up to the desk, they would get start checking out and not realize that the thing didn't actually get checked out and there's no tracking on that really. So um, you can see the button has started glowing red. So I, I did some little timing things on this. So the first thing I did was change these buttons to make them more user-friendly because my libraries don't realize you can click them. Before it's like an icon and um, like a printer icon and an X. So I just added some wording there and then um, 
I set some some timers on it. It's sped up on the test server, so you don't have to sit here for three minutes. But um, the way I have it set up is after a minute, the button starts glowing red to remind them, hey, you probably need to exit the patron because you haven't done anything on this page for a while. Um, and then after two minutes, it'll start a countdown down here that says, hey, I'm going to I'm going to exit this out for you in a minute if you don't do it yourself. So there's a little countdown. And then after the countdown hits zero, it it automatically exits out. And then um, I put a link back to the most recent patron. We've got the last patron button on, but we wanted something in the middle of the screen uh, in case they weren't done. They can go back and keep going on it there. Um, so I'm hoping I didn't reinvent the wheel with the whole account timeout thing because I feel like the conversation has happened before, uh, but I couldn't find anything in the system preferences or anywhere. Um, there isn't one. I've, I've asked for one for a long time, and uh, I'm going to go onto your system and steal that pretty pretty quickly here. Um, yeah, so we're still we're just using it on the statistical patrons for now to like test it out and stuff. Um, but we're thinking it's probably something we're going to put on every patron uh, yeah. for privacy, if nothing else, because we've th those accounts just sat there and people get right. back up. Um, if you go to steal it, it's a mess right now. I haven't posted it anywhere yet. I need to like clean it up and then I, I can probably I'll put it on the wiki. All right, we'll do that today so I can get it tomorrow. <laughs> I'll try. We we upgraded. No, I'm last kidding. Night. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're upgrading on uh Saturday night. The only thing I ran into was that weird hold cancellation bug that people have been talking about where um, if you go to cancel a hold and you don't have cancellation re reasons defined, it doesn't actually cancel the hold at certain points. Um, so I had to set up a cancellation reason. I, I can uh, get you on that. Yeah, I'd like to see that because is I thought the hold cancellation, you only needed the reasons when you're canceling from the holds queue, right? No, it's when you're, well, it affects it when you're the library that brought it to my attention was they went to check it out and they wanted to cancel it with a little checkbox that says cancel hold. And when they tried to do that, it didn't work. Um, Interesting. Yeah. So, well, I guess the bug is three, 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 five, five, three, five. We were upgraded on Monday night, and it feels like searching is slower. Now, I've mostly been on the staff side, so I'm not sure whether it's an OPEC thing or not, but at least in staff, it feels um, just a little more sluggish, and I've been cataloging and getting the sense of, you know, like, okay, I'd like to have the record on the screen so I can deal with it. Um, so I'd be interested if, like, after others are upgraded, if they're sensing any slowness or anything like that. I noticed some when I was, like, so I, I implemented that in-house use stuff on our live production server today, and I noticed that it, it does seem to load the patron account slower for that for some reason. Um than it does on my test server even, which usually it's the opposite. But I haven't had any complaints yet. And usually they're screaming over the wall if things go too slow. Um, but I'll definitely keep an eye on it. We also ran into this bug. Um, we print our third overdue notices and uh, apparently there's been a change in the gather print notices.pl. And so they weren't printing with the right spacing. So they weren't fitting in our win window envelopes and that kind of thing. So uh, just in case anybody uses that, it could be something that you encounter. Okay, I've got an overdue notice set up. Um, 
Let's see, screen number two. So if you go, I've got a overdue item for this patron, uh, which gives me access to the print overdues. Mm -hmm. And so when I actually, um, what I've got, what I put in the notices from, from the document that uh, Andrew sent around, I was looking at this thing, the dumper. Um, and so I put this code in, use dumper, dumper, dump, overdues, unblessed. And this is the result that I get, which is this big string. Um, and it shows me, you know, I've got, uh, this is the data that's in that, um, all the different pieces that I can use. Um, but I'm not sure, I'm just not sure what to do with the data that, that you can get from this dumper thing. So. So, you know, there's, and, you know, confirming the available linkages gets messy is what Andrew says in this document. The information you need is in the Perl, mo Perl module files, and then they, he has a link to the different parts of the, I mean, it's just a lot. There's a lot of stuff in there. And so figuring out, it, it's, I mean, it's some more data, but it's, um, but it's data that I still am not sure what to do with yet. So, so it's a step in the right direction. Um, it's just a, it's just a very dense document. <laughs> So that's what my hope for having Lucas here today would have been to say, you know what, now that I can, I know how to get this data out of the notices, um, what can I do with it? What, what value is it? What value is it to me? Um, and I, cause I'm not sure just looking at it like this. Yeah. I mean, it seems like it helps identify what you can actually use. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, I, <laughs> I can't wrap my head around it either. But maybe someday. Now I have uh, I have managed uh, on the notices and slips library in the wiki. I have um, created. You know, there used to be Barton had put like a list of what are the default notices and slips in Koha. And uh, what I did is, you know, there's different defaults for different versions. So I um, took the data out of Koha and just created a, you know, a separate page for, you know, the default notices slips in 2311, 2305, and 2211, the, the three most recent versions. Um, and then I organized the page that's there so that there's different categories for each type of, you know, the slips all have, the notices and slips all fall into different categories. And so I tried to organize them. And the bottom line is that the only ones that people have ever posted on the, uh, on the Koha Wiki are all the, are all circulation. Nobody's ever posted any custom acquisitions notices or custom member notices or custom anything else. It's all, it's all circ and it's mostly issue slip and issue quick slip. Those are the ones that everybody seems to be um, concerned about. So I'm going to try and post some of ours on there so that there's some variety, some of our, like our welcome message and, and uh, some of our hold messages. But if anybody else has any good messages, they, they should post them too. Yeah, I feel like all that stuff we've just kind of used out of the box for the most part. Like, we, we haven't done much customization on those. I don't know if it's, was it Barbara that you guys had somebody that added a whole ton of HTML tiers that they look really, they look really cool, don't they? 
I've got a full pickup notice that has a lot of HTML and um, links to different things. Um, I was trying to see if I could find one. Um, I have, I'm starting to put in all of our notices. I've created a, a, a set, a, just a block that I can drop in any notice that's just a header that has the next, the next search catalog logo in it. Um, because I can do the logo entirely with text. I don't have to bring in any images since our logo is just different colored letters, N-A-X-T. <laughs> Makes it simple. Um, so I'm trying to add some more stuff there to help people figure out different things they can do with they can do with the notices because essentially anything you can do with an HTML page you can do to a, a notice or a slope. Um, I have another question and this may be far-fetched. <laughs> um, we are archival libraries so we don't have like pictures of books and everything so what I came up with is we have a media room, we have a uh, public room, and we have an archival room. So we have like news microfilm, you go to the media room. Uh, a book, depending on what kind of book, you either go to the archival or the public room. And so instead of having like the book cover, I was thinking of like the actual picture of what type of thing you were checking out. So if it was a book, it would just be like a book. If it was newspaper, you know, to let them know this is a newspaper, but it's on microfilm. Or if it's a kit, there's like a little picture of a kit. There's a picture of a, you know, like if it's archival stuff, a manuscript, there's a little picture for manuscript. How can I get that to display instead of the book cover? Or is it possible? It's possible. Anything yeah. is possible. Um, <laughs> the first place, I I mean, if you want to save yourself any sort of headache and trouble, you could just set up those as icons for your collection codes or um, item types or whatever in the in the administrative section and the authorized values. OK. Um, but if you're wanting it to actually show up in the where the cover image is, then that's going to take a little jQuery um, to generate somehow, I would say, unless George, you've got other ideas. No, that's exactly what I was going to say. There's like a default thing that says no image or something like that. Okay. And you just need to have some jQuery that says, instead of sticking that default image there that says no image to put something else there based on the context. Okay. I just thought about that but I'm I'm not there yet, but it's an idea that I wanted to. Yeah, I understand. Thank you. Don't you have an item type image for like DVDs and Blu-rays that appears depending on the, like the OOH, Jason? Right now we don't yeah. have anything appearing. We don't have any images. <laughs> I can show you what we do in the in the OPAC a little bit. Uh, let me share my screen. So if I do like we um, raise maybe. I've got this image stored in our co database, and then it's um, running some scripts to look at the the actual, uh, oh, I think it's, I think you're right, I think it's the OA and determining that that, or it might be the leader, um, determining that it's a Blu-ray from one of the zero fields and then pulling this out of COA, the co database and putting it onto the search results. And I don't think I put it in the actual records themselves, uh, but it would be, similar um depending on where what you want to do how you want to do it how your records are set up that sort of thing and i can that, try and find the code kind of what i'm 
looking for. Um, it's this big nasty code. <laughs> okay. So we're looking we're looking at the um oh seven and seeing like I haven't looked at this in a while, so can I translate it? Not really. Um, the 07 is if it says VDS in the record, then I'm pulling a Blu-ray. If it's VDV, I'm doing a DVD. Um, so it has, to, it has to do with the catalog encoding. Um, okay. So there's several moving parts here. There's also I've stored the images over here in the uploads section that makes sure that it doesn't like. Um, so that's this image here okay uh maybe or this one um if you store them on an external site then it it, it causes a little blip in the load and i didn't like that um so you have to have that set up special like bywater has to set up that directory if you're wanting to store files in your server like that okay um but after you've got that set up then you can go in um figure out your cataloging and then use something like this to um insert the images okay i'm happy Thanks. to share the code i <laughs> i don't think i've documented what i've done with a lot of that stuff so um but a lot of it also lucas can definitely help you with because i learned how to do that from a write-up that lucas did so okay when i yeah. when i get there I, i'll give you a holler well i think another example of what you might want to do is i just looked up the keys catalog uh uh heather hernandez's catalog and that's the what she's got set up is you know all of the books have this image the magazines and newspapers have that image and uh and that's mostly what they have there i imagine yes and so that that's probably another way to do it and, and it might be using something similar to what jason's doing i wouldn't be surprised if luke has set up that for keys okay so We use the COSI server to just get images from Amazon and Google Books, um, which actually I think Keys might be doing too, but they show up in a different part of the record. Um, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm imagining that you don't have a lot of actual books that are available commercially that have an ISBN number to get that uh, image referral from Google or Amazon. So. Yes. You've got about 10 minutes left. If there's anything else people want to talk about, ask about, share, etc. I found an example of my customized fold slip. So that's what it kind of looks like. And I went to try and find one that was sent to me recently, and I see that it is now broken, which is probably <laughs> something to do with the upgrade because it's not displaying that way. So. Um, but yeah, we, we wanted to get it to be more, um, logo and color and, and, you know, just some, when they got their email that it was exciting, I guess, but <clears throat> we are probably moving the direction of using some third party vendor. We've just been having so many issues with notices and really, really, really angry people yelling at us that they didn't get their whole pickup slips and we're kind of done <laughs> with that. 
So we're probably going to be moving to something that'll, you know, let us do the notices through that. Yeah, that's on my to-do list too, to find some magical third-party vendor that does everything I want it to do, and I haven't haven't gotten that done yet. Uh, I know a lot of them like either just take the data and generate their own notices. I, I really just want something to send my notices <laughs> uh, and do it well instead of what we've got going on right now, like where it gets caught in spam and all that stuff. Well, we've looked at message B from Unique. Um, and we're going to be, we looked at patron point a couple years ago, but we're going to, and didn't do it, but we're going to look at that again. <clears throat> and I think their services, you know, are great. It's just a matter of cost. It's yeah. Like yeah. Cost. <laughs> um, so J Jason, when, when you, um, you're having problems with the notices getting stuck in spam. Always. Um, mm -hmm. How are your notices um, getting sent? A variety of ways. <laughs> so I have some, some libraries set up as SMTP. Um, a lot of times the, the text messages don't, don't get through at all. We're using the text to email on that. Uh, and then I have a majority of my libraries are still using the Amazon Web Services that Bioorder set up and said would fix this. And I have mixed results with each one. Um, because I, I wonder if it could have anything to do with, um, with like domain records, uh, DNS records for like the SPF, um, SPF or, and, um, DKIM records and DMARC, th those things. It totally um, does. And, and yeah. we gave that information to our IT department and they sworn to us that they, entered it the way it's supposed to, but we still have problems. The bottom line is that the issue is there is so much junk email being sent around the world that everybody wants to stop that. Mm -hmm. And all the steps they're taking to stop the things they don't want naturally filter out things that they say they do want. And uh, I've had a lot of times where the patron says, well, I never got an email about that. I never get any of your emails and then I can hit the resend button in their notices tab and then their phone buzzes and there it is, <laughs> you know, and, and I have a lot of that issue. I've had, I've had a lot of that. I've seen a lot of that issue too, where the people say, well, I, I didn't get it until a week later. Well, when did you check your email? Well, a week later, you know, it's, uh, there's just no good. Well, in the, presentation that we had from message B, they told us that, you know, they work with the phone companies and the email providers and all that to be whitelisted so that yeah. their stuff gets through. And then at least in message B, you could click on a specific message. You could see when it was sent, when it was actually delivered, whether the patron opened it at what time they opened it. And so you'd be able to say, well, you know, here's when it was sent and here's when someone in your house clicked on it. So it, it did get there, you know? So I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. And that piece is missing from the call entirely, which is right. also frustrating. Like you can only get so far saying, well, call says it's sent, and I don't know what happened <laughs> after <Right>. that. <laughs> like, there's there's no tracking, and oftentimes the bounce backs are just message wasn't delivered. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, sometimes and, they're useful, and sometimes they're not. It's just a big headache. Yeah, and that gives you this particular product. It would also give you the failures and why it failed, and so we're we're just ready to. The notices have just been such a problem that we're ready to do something different the issue another issue that we've had is that issue that came up at one of the meetings recently where people have these email addresses with these companies like roadrunner.com or rr.com is also another name for them where the company when the people signed up for cable through roadrunner.com which was time warner's 
cable TV division for a while. And they told people, you can have this email address for the rest of your life. And then uh, a year later, they got sold to, a, to another company and they changed their name to Spectrum. And uh, they wanted all those people that they had told they could have that roadrunner.com email address for the rest of their life that, you know, we'd really like you to give it up and get a Spectrum address. And then, and then people said, no, you told us we could have this for the rest of our lives. And so they just consistently make that service crappier and crappier and crappier for those people that are still insisting on using those addresses, hoping that they will just give up with how bad the service is. And then they never do. And then they complain, you know, because the inbox has like a 10 message limit. <laughs> and, and so anything after the 10th message just automatically gets deleted or goes right to their junk mail. And then they, and then they blame us because they don't get the, because we sent the message and they're not able to receive it. Somehow that's our fault when it's really, you know, the, those idiots at Time Warner 20 years ago when they bought AOL because they thought AOL was going to be a big deal. <laughs> and it turned out it wasn't. I still have an SWBell.net personal email. So that still works. I loved when we lived in Boise, um, right after my wife and I first got married, we, our internet was through a company called internet outlet and my account number was 48. <laughs> I think we've sort of covered the gam gambit, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we talked about circulation. Now we're complaining about notices. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's all if connected. it were a local meeting, the only thing left to complain about would be the courier, but we don't have to do that here. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, unless anybody else has anything they want to talk about, I think we can wrap up for today. All sounds good. Thank you. Thank Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everybody, for coming. We'll see you next month. See you later. Bye-bye.